Hello, and welcome to the Forge and Anvil podcast, where we embrace uncomfortable conversations about culture and politics to sharpen ourselves for the race set before us. My name is Connor. I am host of this podcast. If you'd like to support the show, please go to forgeandanvil.locals.com. We appreciate your support. Today's episode is going to be a little bit of a different one than our usual show. Um, we actually had some technical difficulties when we recorded this episode last week. That being said, I went ahead and just um, re-recorded this intro. So we had a guest by the name of Jake Klausner on. He is author of the book, The Downfall of America. I highly recommend you check it out. He was a fantastic guest and he had some great insight. Now, that being said, our technical difficulties caused us to get way off topic by the time that we figured everything out. And uh, ultimately, um, I was asking Jake some questions about his book and um, one thing led to another and we ended up having an impromptu debate between uh, regular guest of the show, Zach Aval and Jake. So I dove in a little bit here and there, but for the most part, I just started to uh, kick back and let them uh, let them talk it out. So I thought it was a great discussion. I think they both enjoyed it. Um, so without further ado, um, Please enjoy some of Jake's uh, interview questions and answers, uh, followed by their impromptu debate. Thanks so much. So that being said, you've written a book. Um, go ahead and tell the audience a little bit about what your, um, your what your book covers and what led you to write it. Yeah, so just to, to give you a quick summary of the book, and this just again, it's called The Downfall of America. Um, basically, it's kind of fighting against the caricature of conservatism that has been put forward by the mainstream media and many people on the left. Um, and it's just giving a summary of a, uh, what I would consider like the average conservative response to a lot of the forces that are trying to tear down the longstanding traditions and institutions of our country. Um, so to give you an example of that, uh, the biblical roots that go along with the founding of the country, uh, the country has been drifting further and further away from the Judeo-Christian values and more and more people are identifying as agnostic, agnostic and atheist. Um, or for another example, how uh, I uh, specified how children are under assault in this country, how uh, there's more and more policies aimed and targeted at children. Um, and they're trying to essentially indoctrinate children with a lot of left leftist values uh, before they actually have a chance to think for themselves. And so um, it's basically, the book is basically a response to all of these um, attacks on longstanding American traditions, longstanding American, tra uh, longstanding American values uh, and things of that, that nature. Awesome. Awesome. And what would, what would you say has been the response to your book so far by both your loved ones and um, any initial readers? Um, for the most part, it's been very positive. Um, mostly friends and family, colleagues, coworkers. Um, most that's the most of the people that have read it so far, um, because it just came out a few months ago. But um, so far, the reactions have been very positive. Awesome, awesome. Now I know I did read through um, your introduction, and you did um, talk a little bit about the cost of courage. So maybe you can go ahead and unpack a little bit of uh, what you wrote there. <laughs> Any anything openly political right now these days, I think is is uh, is definitely um, like whack a mole. You're kind of setting yourself up for um, for the attacks. But um, I'd love if you could kind of unpack that for us. Yeah, absolutely. So. The introduction to the book that you mentioned, um, I go into how I had my sort of political awakening. Um, and for the most part, for the entirety of my life, I never was someone who was interested in or cared about politics. I sort of was sort of just like, uh, you stay out of my way, I'll stay out of your way, right? If politics doesn't directly impact what's going on in my life, I don't really need to care about it. And that's how I lived for most of my life. Um, then 2020 with the COVID pandemic and the lockdowns that ensued, then the government started directly impacting my life. And the, the decisions that the government was making had a huge impact. At that time, I was a first year teacher. Um, and then three quarters of the way through the year, all of a sudden we're switching to com completely remote learning. Uh, we're going to um, entirely online learning, massive transition, and especially hard on a first year teacher. Um, and so that impact that the government had with the lockdowns 
uh, really changed my entire perception. So I started to actually care about what was going on socially and politically at large in the country. And I started paying attention to all of these issues. And the more and more that I paid attention to it, I was like, I, I could tell that it was getting worse and worse. Um, and so I started to, you know, make posts on social media, talk to my friends about it, talk to my family about it, have these conversations about what was going on. And as people realized that I was uh, firmly on the conservative side, there were a lot of people that cut me out of their life, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. So I had a friend that I, that I was friends with for seven years. Uh, he said he didn't want to be friends with me anymore. He said he'd outgrown me. Um, I had people say all sorts of uh, terrible things about me, all sorts of comments. Uh, I won't repeat all of them on here. But um, essentially, I realized that there was a cost to speaking out for what you believe and speaking out for the values that you have. Um, and ultimately I realized that that cost was worth paying. Um, I realized that, uh, it's better to stand true with your values. Um, and people who think like you will find you and you don't have to rely on, uh, superficial friendships or superficial relationships that, uh, they don't actually share, uh, your like-minded values. Um, and you can actually find people who, uh, value the same things that you do. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And now your book is titled the downfall of America. So what, what brought about that title and what would you consider to be, um, causing this downfall? Uh, well, the short answer would be the, the left. Um, and I'm not saying like liberals or, uh, like the more moderate, Democrat. I'm saying the left. Um, and I, in the book, I detail a lot of the differences between liberal and left. Um, Dennis Prager also does a great job detailing the differences between liberal and left. So um, there's lots of ways where you can distinguish the differences between liberal and left. But just to give you one example, uh, a liberal would never say that men can give birth. A leftist would. Uh, a liberal would not... Uh, agree that we should follow the ideas of Karl Marx and implement a communist vision. A leftist would be in favor of that. Um, so there's a lot of differences between liberals and leftists, but the short answer to your question of what's causing the downfall of America, I would say it's the left. Um, and a lot of their policies and a lot of their visions for the country are what's really um, attacking the longstanding traditions and values that we have held dear as Americans for most of our history. Hmm. Yeah. And Zach of all back from the dead, it looks like you had to use your phone or something. Uh, no, I just had to swap cameras is all. Oh, uh, well that worked. Yeah. Well, the battery died. Yeah. Um, do you agree with Jake's assessment in terms of um, the idea of separating um, liberals from left? And do you feel like that threat is um, causing a downfall? Um, I mean, there's a lot to be said for that argument. I would, uh, I guess, where I would disagree is the separation between liberal and leftist, um, simply because I think it's a sort of bait and switch thing that I see a lot of conservatives do uh, with respect, like Dennis Prager. Um, so um, you would, the, one of the the interesting things about con contemporary liberals is. Um, a lot of them actually don't subscribe ad hoc to Marxist ideology. They a version of it for sure, um, and it's something that um, where I would agree with with Jake is that it is not something that should at all be taken seriously. But it is something that they they they, they almost see themselves as carrying on that tradition um, and and succeeding where he failed. So it's a version of Marxism. It's not the same version of Marxism that you would read in. Uh, das Kapital or a Communist Manifesto or anything like that. Um, it's it's something else entirely. So it's almost like they're trying to perfect. I, I don't, I'm trying to tip, I'm tiptoeing around it. I'm trying not to use the word perfect, um, but but they're trying to perfect um, Marx's economic theory and things like that. Hmm. Hmm. Jake, feel free to respond. Uh, well, yeah, I think that the fundamental problem with Marx's ideology is that he misunderstands human nature. Um, and for communism or socialism or whatever you want to call it, for that to be able to work, you have to live in a reality where humans are fundamentally good. 
And that's just not the case that we live in. As humans, we're fundamentally flawed. We have to fight against a lot of uh, bad things about our nature. But when we do that, we can be incredibly good people. Uh, the problem is, in order for communism to work, like I said, you have to live in a reality that just doesn't exist. Um, and for that reason, I don't think that it can ever really be fixed because the foundational belief of that philosophy just goes against human nature. Hmm. Yeah. Do you agree, Zach? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, it was just for matters of clarity. Right. Yeah. So uh, what it, it breaks down to is, is a conflict of visions. And so what a lot of, I'd see, whereas actually Marx was fairly constrained in, in his thinking in terms of how he viewed human beings and, and governing structures and things like that, where contemporary Marxists differ from Marx is that they tend to be unconstrained and they're thinking that you can create that perfect system and that it's um, just a matter of getting in the right people or getting people to believe um, in, in our ideas or not believe in certain ideas. Um, that's one of the things that's been so interesting to me to watch because it's things like like censorship. And I know that's kind of a, a hot button issue right now for, for conservatives and things like that. Um, but one of the things that I think everybody gets wrong about censorship is that the uh the the archetype of the censors it's or what the censors that we run into now are nothing like the archetype so the archetype of the censor is somebody like tipper gore in the the 1980s with trying to save the youth of america from rap music with the parental advisory sticker or when um, we were kids um it was you know stopping kids from reading harry potter and things like that um you know, I, I, out of all the people I've known that have read Harry Potter, do you know how many of them became actual witches? Zero. So, um, no, the, the 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 censor is usually is somebody that's they they usually will predicate a conversation of well, we don't really go there or we don't we don't talk about those things. Um, the, those are the the people you have to watch out for. It's not the the you know the the woke crusaders. Um, is uh, um, which I think is kind of what Jake is, is alluding to there. Um, I don't really see them as a threat, mostly because those types of people, they tend to get crushed under the weight of their own self-righteousness. And they don't, you know, it's annoying to deal with now. Um, and it, it seems, you know, especially with Twitter and TikTok and things like that, it, these ideas seem to be catching fire. Um, but time and time again, they lose out. In, in debate and things like that, um, just due to the nature of what they are. Well, and you talked about the the woke brigade and, mm -hmm. and everything, and whatever you want to refer to them as, yeah. the problem is not necessarily that they're the largest crowd. The problem is that they're the loudest crowd by far, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they have a substantial voice, even though they may be um, a significant minority among the actual population. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, but again, they they those those types of the crusaders and things like that always they they never really succeed. They're always def ultimately defeated by themselves. Really, um, you know, Harry Potter is still circulated in schools. We still you can still buy go to well, I mean, there are no record stores anymore. But back in the eighties, nineties, two thousands, you could still buy music with the parental advisory labor on there and things like that. So, um, and it just, it, it changes from time to time, you know? So this is just what we're currently dealing with and it's annoying. Um, but I, you know, and it's not, and it's not to say that we shouldn't engage with these people, right? Cause these are after all people that we are in church with or in school with, um, we teach, you know? Um, so it's not to say to avoid them or ignore them entirely. Um, but I don't, I'm not, I don't personally see them as a threat because the, the precedent to me, to me at least is clear that they, they collapse under the weight of their own self-righteousness. Hmm. Well, and yeah. I think they, they will collapse under the weight of their, uh, their ideology because it's not really built on anything like everything that they say often contradicts something else that they have said. Um, you know, for, for example, they claim that abortion is a women's health care issue, 
but then they won't tell you what a woman is in order so that they don't upset the the transgender crowd. Mm. Um, and so a lot of their arguments are self-contradictory to their own arguments, but those um, contradictions and that house of cards will only fall if we continue to point out the truth and to uh, speak out against the, the radical ideology being foisted upon the country and being foisted especially upon the children. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think, I think the, the main thing that I would say I disagree with the, with uh, your point, Zach, is is um, I think I agree with the point of um, I think that they are going to collapse under their own ideology, especially because they they constantly are, um, you know, and when I say they, I'm referring to who Jake laid out as being yeah. the left. Um, you know, uh, they do tend to have a lot of um, uh, ideological purges um you know if you're not 100 percent on the same page they do purge you and that's where i think that they're going to fall apart long term but i think i think where they're a bigger threat than um than like a middle-aged mom that was complaining about harry potter back in the day um is the amount of power that i think that they have um i would view the uh the reason for their power is i think that the democratic party has really caved to a lot of the um, more extreme uh, wings of their of their parties and i don't know if it's a um you know you look at you look at some democratic uh, senators um like mark kelly in arizona i think the reason why he's really um uh, gone so far to the left is maybe he was fearful of a primary challenge um i know that there are people in the progressive uh, wing of the democratic party that uh, essentially has threatened those um those primary challenges um so i, I think what i would say um in response to um uh, in, in response to you is that they do have a lot of power because the entire democratic um, uh, party really does capitulate to their uh, desires um, and their desires are very, very far to the left, much more than uh, most Americans are comfortable going. And so I don't think that they really have hardly any moderates in the democratic party anymore because those who are moderate um, really for the most part tend to just be a rubber stamp on those um, far left lean, leaning policies. So that's where I see them currently having a lot of power. Well, um, they don't sell headlines. See, that's where I, I, I think that's where I think I disagree with you is because if you look at um, people's just opinions on Joe Biden, especially people to the left, they're not happy. Um, and they're not happy with people like AOC or any member of the squad. These people that I, I, I agree with you are pretty, pretty far to the left and they're pretty vocal. Uh, the, the Democratic Party is actually fairly moderate. I mean, if you look at people who've killed the where most of the um, extreme, even just think like the two big issues, right? Gun control and abortion. Um, those legislations are more often than not killed on the Senate floor by moderate Democrats. So I think that the party itself is overwhelmingly moderate. Um, it's just that, again, it goes back to kind of what we were talking about in the last episode. Um where they they grab headlines, right? So we we see more of AOC, and they're also active on social media, especially a lot of the younger ones. Um, so I, I don't think that they have as much power as we're being honestly as we're being led to believe they do. Um, so I mean, again, that doesn't mean don't address it, don't you know, expose these ideas for what they are. Um, I'm not saying sit on the sidelines. I'm saying is just be 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 careful and and you know pick your battles. Yeah, that's all. Well, I think I, I would disagree with you there in saying that they don't have the power, because if you look at every major institution in America and they're leaning further and further and further. Correct. I mean, academia is leaning further to the left. Higher education is leaning further to the left. Major corporations, big tech, they, they all are leaning further and further and further left. They have pretty much every um institution of power on their side mm -hmm. and as the the you know loud minority of the woke crowd continues to push uh the democratic party further and further left all of these institutions are also being pushed further and further to the left and it creates almost like a, a monolith of uh ever shifting uh power structure further and further to the left Sure. Um, but again, um, 
one of the things you have to pay attention to is is the young people. They're always resistant to what's in vogue. A lot of them, you know, are one of like there's like libs of TikTok and things like that, where uh, it's a lot of. I mean, they are getting exposed to these ideas. You are correct. Um, academia, academia has always been dominated by the left. It's something that people in academia and, and, and teachers, you probably ran into this, no doubt, or intimately more aware of it than, than maybe Connor or I are. Um, yeah, it's always been that way. Those jobs just don't really attract for whatever reason. And then there's a whole other conversation we can have about that, why those jobs aren't appealing to people on the right. But again, like if you look, kids are always looking for ways to be countercultural. In the 80s, it was rock and roll and Dungeons and Dragons. Um, in, in a weird way, we're almost coming back full circle. It's something I've been thinking about and watching like Church and Tedden's rise amongst young people. It's because there is, as you guys have talked about, and I think we're all three of us are in agreement on those those pressures um, and some of those more radical ideas like getting people away from church and things like that. As a way of resisting that, um, because it's so in vogue, they're actually going back to church and getting saved and things like that. So. Um, I don't think it's as dire. I just, I can't, I can't find myself going there. Again, it's something, that I, I can't stress this enough. It's something to keep an eye on. I think you guys are absolutely correct. And I don't think we are at all in a disagreement with that. I'm just saying, I don't think it's as severe. Um, and I, you know, I think we, we really should be judicious on that. And, um, you know, it's easy to get caught up in like the AOCs and things like that of the world or the Bernie Sanders of, of the world and things like that. But again, those types of arguments fall apart factually. Um, and then those movements fall apart against, like Connor was kind of outlining there, because you don't, if you don't accept the three by five card of allowable opinion, or if you deviate from the three by five card of allowable opinion in any shape or form, you're left st stranded on the outside. And there's tons of people who are, I think of, you know, uh, Brett and Eric, um, Weinstein, you know, those deeply progressive people, um, you know, f certainly further to the left than me, um, but they feel ostracized by, you know, um, their, their, their fellow uh, leftists um, and have built sizable followings doing their own thing. And I'm kind of bringing back, you know, people our age closer to the center. Um, mm -hmm. So there's things like that, you know, to keep an eye on as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that I think that the 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 difference that I would say with um, the, the disagreement I would take with um, the threat level assessment is I believe that there are individuals who are just blindly supporting the party and whatever the current thing is um, the the non person you know the, the npcs they sure. they are really the ones that i think are um they're a threat in regards to um they are an annoyance and they they vote <laughs> but aside from that i wouldn't say that they are the threat i would say what the threat is and this is probably something that jake would um probably uh, agree with as well is i i do believe that um those are just the um for lack of a better term, useful idiots um, that no, are right. are platforming a much more sinister force, which is the slow march to the institutions and the taking over of the seven pillars of a society. Um, and I do think that to Jake's point earlier, that the uh, major institutions, whether that be um, Hollywood, whether that be mainstream media, whether that be education, um, they are left leaning. And then, of course, right now, you could also say that the Democrats control um you know the house the senate and the 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 white house um to your point about moderates in the party too i would disagree because i would say that there are a couple of moderates if you want to call them moderates which would be at least in terms of the in the uh the senate you there's, specifically there's, mentioned there's quite a few i mean like it's i think there are there are people that that set themselves up in in um, rhetoric as being moderate, but I think their their voting records don't show that. I would say the only real real moderates that I would see in the Senate would be uh, Cinema as well as Mansion. Um, aside from that, though, for the most part, most things are just rubber stamped um, for whatever the Biden administration wants to see passed to the Senate. I'm not saying that there's not some more moderates in the House. I think you can make that argument much more in the House, but just in terms of the Senate, I really don't see. The moderates, aside from cinema and mansion, who 
only deviate on a couple of of issues really yeah but i mean you also have to look at not just the the people in power but the people that put them in power is kind of where i'm coming from is um a lot more democratic voters are far more moderate and the reason why we have those candidates there is because they were it was them or somebody further to the left i think about my friend who actually works for the our state um gop here the republican party of washington state the only reason he has his job is because the other guy that was up for it scared him like he wanted to do like coups and things like that it's he was essentially from what i gather just based off our conversations he was like what everybody or what the mainstream media let's say would have you believe a um a, a trump supporter is or a modern day conservative is um and that spooked him <laughs> enough to run for his you know position um so um again there are I, people are not happy with the biden presidency just across the board even especially people the, the where it matters to me the most is the people that voted for him because it's really telling um to where the democratic party currently is and where it's heading and i would say the same thing for the republican party as well um you know the response post trump um you know there are there there are pains in these movements um and it's almost an identity crisis and i think what we're seeing here um in over the if in the long run what we're seeing is is a bend more towards moderation is a pulling back um towards the center through through people that they've ostracized and they're learning that um radicalism isn't the solution there and so we'll have at some point maybe not this certainly not this election cycle and not even in the last one but in the next few election cycles we'll start to see and then now uh, tulsi gabbard again also somebody i would consider fairly moderate democrat just actually just left the democratic party um to do her own thing and it's probably going to take a lot of people with her as well so um people in power respond to those things it's kind of what we were talking about again in the last episode um if you show up or you know support something else people pay attention to that um so i you know i if i were where i a democrat i would be fairly optimistic right now it sucks being where you're at you kind of have to make peace with that but i think you'd be pleasantly surprised to see what happens hmm. to the so, left going forward so i think that there's a bit of a misunderstanding here in what we're actually talking about because from what i gather zach it seems like you are talking more about the democratic voter base and then connor and i are talking more about the actual democrats running the oh show. i'm i'm trying to talk about both in in one because you can't have one without Ooh, the right? other but i think um, that it sounds like when you're talking about how there's a lot more moderate democrats than what you're talking about you're focusing on how people are res how the common people are responding to yep. what the administration is doing and what is currently going on mm -hmm. uh, where we're focusing on what's happening in like what's actually being done by the party leadership sure. and by the actual politicians that have power uh, is that like an accurate thing to say and then i have a well a so i think maybe maybe I'm, i i was trying to split um my conversation between the two um so maybe i didn't do the best job balancing that um but no i i i mean if you look at like like you are correct like there are some radicals in there i'm not trying to dismiss that i'm saying is is i don't think um they have the voice that would that that we are being told that they have um and i think their rhetoric both on and off mainstream media and platforms and things like that is is pretty clear like those those same politicians were taught that the democratic party itself is not happy with president biden and there have been people that have gotten in trouble for expressing that displeasure and I think that is a very, very good sign, especially as we head into another election season, because what that signals to me is that if Biden were for some crazy reason decided to run again, I don't think he would be successful. Hmm. Um, and I don't and I don't think their their solution to stopping Biden again is to have a radical run. I think the smartest thing that they could do is have somebody that is not um, a radical actually honestly to have the most boring person you can think run 
Right. I think that would be the smart thing to do. Whether or not they actually do that is uh, remains to be seen. Um, but then my my follow up question to before um, we talked about the like the level of threat assessment and how we perceive mm-hmm. things differently. So Zach, my question to you is: At what point does the threat assessment actually reach the higher levels that? Uh, the conservative side seems to be at because from where I look at it, the country is being radicalized at a rather alarming rate. The former governor of Virginia saying that we should allow abortions after birth. If the mother decides we, that she doesn't want the baby when we have uh, the rate of transgender youth doubling in pretty Mm -hmm. much every successive generation since the, the mid 20th century, when we have people, you know, supporting, socialism despite the you know nearly 100 million people that died mm-hmm. under those regimes in the 20th century like at what point does the radicalization become too far when all of these things are shifting at an alarming rate i mean the the favorable views of socialism and communism among college age kids is over 50% now now today so I'm like, what? at what point does it actually get to the point where it's too much and we've gone too far? Yeah, I mean, a lot of those, those. I mean, those, again, circling back around. So those, a lot of college kids have those left-wing viewpoints and end up being a little bit, they, they may still be to the left, but they're never going to, they don't, they don't stay on the radical left very long. Radicals don't stay radical for very long unless it's profitable to them. So, I mean, and then as far as like you, you are, uh, you mentioned the uh, guy from Virginia talking about abortions after the, nobody takes those um, ideas very seriously. If you look at, um, at people's actual opinions on abortion, um, it's very rare that you find people that actually support very late term abortions there. Mm-hmm. Um, same I, with, I have, to, and, I have to push back on that because um, every time I see, people having these discussions on college campuses or even like in cities, they walk through the cities Mm -hmm. and they'll have these discussions. Pretty much everyone on the left says it's a woman's right to choose and she should be able to have an abortion at any point. And pretty much everyone on the right says we need some level of restriction. Um, Yeah. I mean, again, all everybody I know that has, that it would be pro choice. They do not support, um, six um, uh, late term abortions it's for it's the every uh, i think conservatives and liberals agree far more on abortion than they i think they realize they do and i think even people that some of these uh, radical voices that we talk about lead us to believe that they do that's one of the things that has shocked me the most about that and then as far as the transgenderism amongst youth it is illegal to perform um gender reassignment of surgeries on my third. That's why when we were talking about, I don't know if you listened to that episode that we did a few weeks ago where Vanderbilt was kind of under fire, because if that investigation reveals that they were performing gender reassignment surgery on minors, they have broken medical, they've broken laws. Um, And the trans community itself is also very against gender reassignment surgery on minors uh, because there's very, there's, it's because it's so new. Um, and the, one of the things that I think people kind of forget about is like the chemicals and things like that for testosterone and things like that, that can be reversed at, at an early age. And so um, I think a lot of this stuff, again, is seems to be the caricatures of what it's concerning. Like, I don't I'm, I don't mean to dismiss that. And I don't think and I don't disagree with you on that. Um, but when it comes to when where, to answer your question, at what point do I see this as like an actual threat to be addressed more seriously? It's when reason are, is completely out the window, when these character caricatures are actually becoming true. I think a lot of the I, I just don't I, most of the time you can you can sh- show a college age socialist why socialism is wrong, like Ludwig von Mises, the economist, wrote two treatises on it called the Socialist Calculation Theory that absolutely levels any economic argument for socialism. I mean, the political ramifications speak for itself, like you were talking about the millions dead. You know, they, they, the, once people are ignoring actively 
not just a few, not just college kids, but everybody across the board, every Democrat and elected official is ignoring that. And they're doing so unironically, and they're not doing so to get attention for their campaign. I know we're kind of running out of time. That's when I'll start to take it more seriously. I just don't see that happening right now. Yeah, and I, and I have to push back uh, on the, the transgender stuff that, that you talked about. Um, it's not just like going on with the, the younger crowd. I mean, you have Katanji Brown Jackson going before Congress and yeah. asked, what is a woman? And she can't answer. She just says, well, I'm not a it's biologist. A question, yeah, it's a question know. that has no answer. That it's a it's it a question has that a they very to... clear answer. No, I mean when they're when they when they're in those situations, it's a it's I mean, it's, it's part of it. Yeah. Well, and they're also they're playing a political game there, right? We all right. everybody in that room knows that there's an answer to that question, but they don't answer that question because they're playing a political game. And I think right. that's the and I think that's the the big problem is because mm. they're playing this political game, but they they don't seem to grasp that they're playing with people's lives because when people make these decisions, they're not very, they're not rever as reversible as, as you might think, especially because well, not for adults, but for um, the, the well, chemicals it's not for even, kids. It's not reversible for kids either. We, we no, it is. Know, it definitely is. We do not know what the results of this will be. This generation has become essentially a generation of Guinea pigs for these surgeries and for these hormones we have no idea what the ramifications of this there's will be. there's very clear medical literature that, that you can access not, right now about not. hormone blockers and testosterone look i don't think they should be taking it if we want to have that conversation i'm absolutely in agreement with you but to say that these chemicals can't be that can't be reversed and things like that like chemical castration cannot be reversed but testosterone and things like that absolutely can in the youth well, and some and of the is, drugs that they're giving these kids as puberty blockers. Yeah, those, again, that can be, the, the medical literature is quite clear on that. Drugs. Yeah, the medical literature is quite clear on that. That can be reversed. Um, I, it's just something that I've seen circulated. Um, again, I don't think we should be giving those to kids, but to say that um, it's irreversible is not correct. Hmm. It, I have to disagree with you there. The The medical information that we have is far too new. No, it is. You're correct. It's new. I don't disagree with you on that. We don't have the long-term studies to know if this is actually reversible for these children and we're playing with their lives and their futures. No, yeah. correct. And I'm saying we, yeah, we shouldn't be forcing right. these on people, but. All right. Well, we, we, we are running low on time, so. Um, now, obviously, there's a lot of uh, places we can go with this conversation. Um, I, I wasn't sure we'd get into a debate. I didn't think we would. But hey, you know, it happened. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, I do know that we <laughs> we didn't get a chance to discuss them. Jake, your first time on here. But I do know there is actually a lot more that you will probably find agreement with Zach on. Um, but you found you found the couple that you don't. <laughs> So, um, so good job for that. Cause you know, you've, uh, you, you guys, uh, got to push each other. That was a lot of fun. Um, well, we'll definitely have to have you back on Jake. Cause I know that we had those technical difficulties in the beginning. Um, but I want to leave you with the last word. Feel free to, you know, um, plug your book as well as, um, whatever left message you want to leave with the audience. Um, uh, go ahead and, uh, and say your piece and then we'll definitely schedule time to have you back on when we can, um, hopefully uh, mitigate some of the uh, technical difficulties better next time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, the best place to to hear more, if you want to hear more of what I have to say is to just check out the book, the downfall of America. Uh, it's available from the publisher author house. Uh, you can also find it on Barnes and Noble or Amazon. Uh, I detail a lot of different things about the social and political issues going on in the country. Um, and essentially the gist of, what the book is getting at. Um, I took Ronald Reagan's idea that freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. And I turned it into more of a challenge is don't let freedom be, uh, don't let freedom become extinct in your lifetime. Make sure it's there for your children and for theirs and make sure it's there for the future. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Zach, real quick, just tell people where they can find you and then we'll sign off. Yeah. Zach of all music on Instagram. Zach Haval on YouTube. I'd stream live Tuesday nights, live music. Um, I'm alternating between singer-songwriter stuff and electric boogaloo.
Awesome. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for watching. This has been an episode of the Forge and Anvil podcast. If you want to support the show, go to forgeandanvil.locals.com. Thanks so much for watching.